Testosterone therapy for older men has skyrocketed in popularity, and if you've clicked this video, chances are you've considered it or know someone who has, and the chances are also good that you're aware of some of the controversy surrounding it. There have been some sharp disagreements about its benefits and risks, and who should be using it. By the end of this video, you'll have the insights that you need to make an informed decision about testosterone therapy. We're going to have a look at the fascinating history of testosterone treatment, see what the best science says right now, and talk about a controversy around a new study that could change how we move forward. And if you want weekly health research summaries and health strategies that I share with my patients, sign up using the link in the pinned comment. Now, we've actually had some idea about the effects of testosterone for a really long time. People knew that the testes produced something that had a massive impact on behavior. In the ancient world, castration was sometimes used to make slaves more passive and obedient. Incredibly, it was also used to keep males from going through puberty to preserve their singing voice. Noticing the these effects, people from Roman times tried eating animal testes to increase the energy and sexual function. A French scientist tried out a more sophisticated version of this approach in the late 1800s. He gave himself daily injections of a mixture that he took from animal testes and claimed to see dramatic results. He reported gaining strength and increased energy. But we know that this could have only been a placebo effect. That crude approach couldn't actually work. They were on the right track, but their understanding had a long way to go. In particular, we needed to know what was in the testes that explained these effects on the body. We started to make real progress in the 1800s though. A German scientist conducted a novel experiment. He castrated several roosters and then transplanted the testes into some of them and compared their behavior. He noticed that those who got the transplants had normal male rooster behaviors, but the others didn't. His conclusion about what was going on was remarkable for the time. He theorized that the testes were producing something that traveled through the blood and affected the whole body. In other words, they were producing what we now call a hormone. In the early 1900s, researchers figured out more about hormones and how they work in the body. They began to identify and isolate them chemically. Big breakthroughs came through in the 1930s. Scientists finally discovered the crucial hormone made by the testes and called it testosterone. In the same decade, they figured out how to synthesize testosterone in the lab. But now the question was this, can we use testosterone to treat men whose testosterone levels are low? And if so, how? And this turned out to be harder to answer than we expected. It was found that taking testosterone orally didn't work. It was broken down by the liver and didn't wind up in the blood. A different form was developed that seemed to be effective when taken orally, but this was later found to have toxic effects on the liver. Testosterone was also given via injections, and those seemed to work better. But until the 1970s, we didn't have a good way to measure testosterone levels in the blood. We were aiming for a target of normal, but we couldn't tell if we'd hit it. Once new testing methods became available, we had a bit of a shock. All of the methods of testosterone delivery then in use made levels either too high or too low. We needed something better. And that came in the 1990s with a patch applied to the skin. This finally gave us a way to reliably achieve normal testosterone levels. There are several other reliable methods in use today, including gels and injections. This was a really exciting development. We were at a point where we could accurately measure testosterone levels and help raise them up in men when they were low. But we quickly found ourselves with two problems. The first is that testosterone treatment surged in popularity. Health influencers began to tout its benefits for improving strength, energy, and sexual function. And men started using it even when their testosterone levels weren't clinically low. The second is that new data emerged where testosterone therapy could have dangerous adverse effects. So where does this leave us now? Well, let's have a look at what the clinical guidelines tell us about who should consider testosterone therapy and what the true risks are. Then we'll examine a new study and the controversy it's causing in the field, because this one is huge. So who's an appropriate candidate for therapy? Well, the current guidelines rest on three important considerations. The first is that we know that unusually low testosterone levels can have negative effects. The first to show up is usually decreased energy levels, weaker sex drive, and a depressed mood. And we know from multiple randomized clinical trials that testosterone therapy can counteract some of these problems. Studies have shown that it can improve libido and sexual function, and therapy can improve muscle mass and strength. In one study, for example, 10 weeks of therapy increased fat-free mass, muscle volume, and the maximum weight participants could lift. Testosterone therapy can also improve bone density. A long-term study found that it could increase and then maintain bone density in men who had low testosterone before treatment. But what about mood? Well, a large study of testosterone therapy in older men, participants reported better mood and milder depressive symptoms compared to the control group. 
Overall, this much is clear. Low testosterone can cause problems, and if a person has symptoms of low testosterone, testosterone therapy can help correct them. That's the first important consideration that underlines the current guidelines. But the second is this. We don't have good evidence about the benefits of testosterone therapy for those whose levels aren't abnormally low. And I'll go through the new controversial study shortly. Now, the word abnormal is important. As we age, testosterone levels, they naturally fall. And this means that an older man will generally have testosterone levels that are significantly lower than a younger man. But this doesn't mean that their levels are low in a clinical sense. What I mean by this is that testosterone levels don't generally fall to a level where issues occur. In contrast, clinically low testosterone levels that cause symptoms are usually due to problems in the testes or the region of the brain that controls testosterone testosterone production. But as more people know that testosterone declines with age and affects things like sexual function, lots of men whose levels aren't abnormally low are trying therapy. Prescription sales of testosterone ballooned from 100 million in 2000 to 2.7 billion already by 2013 and it's only gone up from there. But most of the research to this point has been done in men with low testosterone and who have developed symptoms. So can therapy benefit those who are simply experiencing the normal decline due to aging? And at this point, we simply don't have the data to say. And you might think, well, even if it does nothing, it may help, so why not try it? Well, this is where the third consideration comes in. There are risks associated with testosterone therapy. And again, the new controversial study does shed some extra light to this conversation, but up until this point, one study found that testosterone therapy is linked to an increase in plaque in the arteries, and testosterone therapy can raise red blood cells. This is a condition called erythrocytosis. It's the most common adverse effect of therapy. The concern is that all of this can lead to higher blood pressure, blood clots, and heart attacks. So far, the data on those using testosterone therapy correctly, they don't clearly show a higher risk of these problems, but the evidence is mixed and inconclusive. It has led to both the Endocrine Society and the FDA to issue warnings about the potential cardiovascular risks of therapy. Taking these three considerations together, the clinical guidelines recommend that testosterone therapy should only be used in those that have got clinically low levels with symptoms. The reasoning is that this balances our confidence in the benefits with our awareness of the risks. The guidelines recommend against older men taking testosterone who don't have symptoms or whose levels aren't low. In these cases, there are known risks with unclear benefits. But a new study has caused a lot of controversy and its results seem to require a big adjustment in the logic that we've just looked at. The study was called the Transverse Trial. It centers on the question of cardiovascular risk and it involved over 5,000 middle-aged older men with pre-existing heart disease or a high risk of it. These men also met the normal conditions for testosterone therapy. They had clinically low testosterone levels and symptoms of deficiency. So after around two years of treatment, researchers followed them up for another three years. They were looking for symptoms of heart problems, including heart attacks and strokes. Here's what they found. 7% of the participants taking testosterone had heart attacks or strokes during the study. Now that sounds fairly high, but the figure for the placebo group was even higher at 7.3%. So the researchers concluded that testosterone replacement therapy is no worse than the placebo when it comes to causing heart problems. And at first glance, it looks like the study has important implications. If there isn't actually an increased risk of heart problems with testosterone therapy, then we don't have to be as cautious about prescribing it. Maybe more men could then try it, even if the benefits at this point are slightly unclear. But does this study really show that the heart disease risks are overblown? Well, that's certainly how some people are interpreting it. Experts at a recent conference on testosterone treatment claimed that the study can finally put to rest the anecdotal and wholly unproven fear physicians have that testosterone therapy will cause heart problems. But let's take a closer look at the study ourselves. Yes, the percentage of patients who experienced heart problems was lower in the testosterone group, but we need to look at the confidence intervals. This tells us the range the number could fall within if we were to repeat the study multiple times. In this case, the range goes from the testosterone group having 22% fewer problems to having 17% more. Collecting more data would allow us to narrow that range down. It would give us more confidence about the actual impact of testosterone therapy. But for now, the study tells us that it's unlikely to be worse than a 17% increase. But a 17% increase, however, would surely be worth paying attention to. And surprisingly, the study design allowed for the conclusion that testosterone therapy is no worse than a placebo, even if it increased the incidence of heart problems by 50%. 
And there are further issues with the study. The study had a very high dropout rate. About 62% of those in the testosterone group stopped treatment before the study was over. This means that a majority of the testosterone group didn't actually complete the therapy that the study was supposed to evaluate. Also, the therapy often did not succeed in getting the testosterone levels in the target range for many of the men in the trial. An expert researcher on heart disease, Dr. Matthew Budoff, rightly asks, given that a majority of men were treated only to a low normal range of testosterone, with short and incomplete follow-up and large discontinuation rates, how is the conclusion that testosterone therapy is safe? So despite the results of the transverse trial, the evidence that we have still points towards caution. So what are the key takeaways then? If we're over 50 and considering testosterone therapy, what do we need to keep in mind? Well, despite the controversy about the transverse trial, the consensus now is that we should stick to the clinical guidelines that we've looked at. We should only consider testosterone therapy for those with clinically low testosterone and symptoms that go along with it, like a low sex drive, depressed mood, or they're losing muscle mass. And there's another important point to add. We need to investigate why testosterone levels are low. For example, low testosterone can be driven by obesity. One study found that a BMI of over 30 was associated with nearly nine times the risk of low testosterone. So obesity, diabetes, and chronic illness can lower our levels. We should evaluate and address those root causes first, if at all possible. So losing weight and doing resistance exercise are a must and definitely should be done before considering adding testosterone replacement therapy. And if you really want to look at other ways to boost testosterone, there is another path. We've seen supplements promising to do this, but not all claims, unfortunately, are backed up with evidence. There is one supplement, however, that does have good evidence for boosting testosterone, plus athletic performance, and it's betaine, or TMG, and that's why I included it in microvitamin. But just because I take a supplement does in no way mean that you should as well. And there are many other popular supplements out there, so in this next video here, I look at what the evidence says. Do supplements like ashwagandha and L-arginine actually increase testosterone levels? So keep watching to find out.